Okay, good evening. Uh, welcome to this Brennan Center for Justice event at New York University School of Law. I'm Ted Johnson, a senior fellow here at the Brennan Center. As many of you know, the Brennan Center is a nonpartisan law and policy institute that works to reform and revitalize and, when necessary, defend the systems of democracy and justice. Tonight, we're extremely excited to bring you this conversation as part of Carnegie Hall's second annual citywide festival. The theme of this year's festival is Migrations, the Making of America. It celebrates the movement of people seeking new lives and how their contributions shape the nation and define what it means to be American. Tonight's discussion, however, is going to explore an intranational migration. At the turn of the century, 90% of black Americans lived in the South, but by 1970, that number decreased to 53%. The outflow of black citizens from the South to the North, the Midwest, and the West is what we call the Great Migration. Between 1910 and 1970, six million descendants of enslaved black people left the South in search of civil rights protections and economic opportunities. What they often found, however, was more racial discrimination. The impact of their journey created seismic cultural, economic, and political changes that continue to reverberate today, and though this is the discussion we'll be having tonight. We gave the first word of tonight's discussion to the migrants themselves, and now I'd like to invite up our panelists, Mark Whitaker, Marsha Chatlin, and Kenesha Grant. Dropping the mic already. <laughs> Drop, that's right. The video dropped the mic, if anything. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Mark Whitaker. Um, thanks for coming. Really looking forward to, uh, to this discussion. Uh, thanks to everybody uh, at the Brennan uh, Center and to our friends at Carnegie Hall for, uh, for putting this together. Um, uh, I uh, spent, am a recovering journalist. <laughs> Um, uh, I've spent most of my career uh, in um, print and television journalism, but uh, more recently I've become a book author, and my latest book um, is about the legacy of the black community of Pittsburgh uh, during this period. It's called Smoketown, the untold story of the other great uh, black renaissance. Um, uh, on the panel uh, I, uh, today, we have uh, a number of uh, other uh, scholars who come at this subject um, from, um, from different uh, vantage points and expertise. Uh, Marcia Chatelaine is um, Associate uh, Professor of History and African American Studies at Georgetown um, and the author of Southside Girls, Growing Up in the Great Migration, which looks at um, the generation of young black women uh, who grew up in Chicago, is that right? Um, uh, in, uh, uh, during this period. Um, Kanisha Grant is an assistant professor uh, of uh, political science at Howard University. And she has a book at, coming out soon called Relocation and Realignment, How the Great Migration Changed the Face of the Democratic Party. Um, there's a Pittsburgh connection in that too, which maybe we can talk about. Um, uh, and then, uh, of course, uh, our empresario tonight, the person who uh, put this all together, Ted Johnson from uh, a senior fellow uh, at uh, the Brennan Center. Um, so um, it's going to be great to, uh, to discuss all of this with you. So I, I'm going to start, eventually we'll get to audience Q&A. Uh, but I think I wanted to start just by, since all of us have, uh, have either written books or have books coming out, uh, and have spent a lot of time uh, looking at, at this from, the, from, from that perspective, to just tell you a little bit about sort of what we discovered in our books, and then we can get, by the end I hope, both in our own discussion and then also in the Q&A, to some of the relevance of this history to what's happening today, because in addition to it being one of the most seismic historical events uh, of the 20th century, I think uh, what happened in the Great Migration explains a lot of what is still happening in black America and in America in general today. Um, so um, in my book, uh, I looked at black Pittsburgh, um, uh, which although it was small, 
the black community of Pittsburgh was small in, in relation to Harlem, Chicago, some of the bigger black communities. Uh, in the period that I look at from the uh, late 20s until the early uh, 60s was arguably after uh, uh, Harlem, New York, and Chicago, the most influential black community in a variety of, of areas. Uh, one was journalism, where the Pittsburgh Courier during this period was the most influential black paper. It had overtaken, at, l at least for a while, the Chicago Defender, which was the original great national black newspaper. Um, the uh, two greatest Negro League teams of the 1930s, both came from Pittsburgh, the Crawfords and the Grays. Um, some of the greatest jazz musicians of that era came from Pittsburgh, Billy Strayhorn, Billy Eckstein, Mary Lou Williams. Um, uh, and in the middle of all of this in 1945, August Wilson, our greatest black playwright, was, was born in Pittsburgh. Um, so to a large extent, my book is a celebration of the accomplishment of this community, despite everything they were up against. Um, uh, and I talk in the book about how, and I think one of the things that's interesting about the Great Migration is that you can make broad generalizations about the experience of all the migrants, but I think the actual, the story of, of the communities and in individual cities varies partly on where the migrants came from and the conditions that they encountered when they got there. In the case of Pittsburgh, one of the things that sort of made for this great period of creativity and entrepreneurship was a lot of the migrants who came from Pittsburgh, particularly in the first waves of the migration, came not from the deep south, but from the northern eastern parts of the south. So um, uh, some of them came from families that had been freed for generations. Those who came who were descendants of slaves, often they had been uh, house slaves. Um, and therefore had learned to, to read and, off, and, and uh, read music and play instruments. So they arrived in Pittsburgh with a lot of culture. Second, um, in the wake of the Gilded Age in Pittsburgh, Carnegie and um, Andrew Carnegie and uh, the Mellon family and so forth and so on, the public schools in Pittsburgh were very well funded in the early part of the 20th century. And they admitted, not in huge numbers, but they admitted black students. So a lot of the people I write about uh, in my book uh, were beneficiaries of, uh, of, of, of that public school system in that uh, era. Um, and the third was that there was a sort of a spirit of entrepreneurship. P Pittsburgh was a kind of a, you know, an industrial town where um, you black folks, often they were serving the black community, but were starting businesses and so forth. So that's what created um, this, this, this renaissance. But then I talk at the end of the book about what destroyed it. And I think this is, I think a lot of the factors here, I think are common to a lot of these communities. Number one, obviously, was industrial decline. The migrants in Pittsburgh had come, as migrants did to Chicago and all the other cities, for jobs in the factories or other jobs that would depend on, on the strength of, of, of those industries. And all of a sudden, those industries very quickly started to go into decline at a period when White folks could get loans and move to the suburbs and transition to other kinds of jobs. Black folks were stuck in the city, you know, um, uh, uh, to, 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 uh, to, to deal with that. The second, in Pittsburgh, but I think in other cities too, was the disastrous um, effect of urban renewal, particularly in the early waves of urban renewal, where in the case of Pittsburgh, the Hill District, which anybody who has seen August Wilson plays, you know about the Hill District, was literally torn down to build a civic arena <laughs> um, uh, in the late 50s. And in addition to destroying the most historic and vibrant part of the black community of Pittsburgh, it cut the rest of the black community off from downtown. Um, but then the third factor that I talk about at the end of my book is what I call, there was white flight, there was also black middle class flight. <laughs> Um, that uh, when starting in the 60s and the 70s, you had black folks, thanks to the civil rights movement, affirmative action, who had opportunities to, educational opportunities to go to college, to move away, to make careers elsewhere, and a lot of them didn't come back. And this was, I got interested in Pittsburgh because my dad grew up in Pittsburgh, and he was part of that generation. You know, he went away to college and became a college professor, and he never went back, and you had a whole generation that 
previously, ironically, under segregation, would have stayed. You know, the most ambitious, the most educated members of the community, the so-called talented tenth, would have stayed in those black communities and become leaders. And instead, they went on to, to, to lives and careers elsewhere. And at precisely the point when those black communities needed leadership, they were left, um, they were left without it. Um, so anyway, so that's, that's the, uh, the story of my, my book. As I say, largely a celebration of the accomplishments, but then with a really sad, poignant, tragic end, very quickly, starting as early as the 50s and the 60s, and unfortunately, for the most part, it just got, got worse after that. Um, so just to sort of stay in order here, in the way we got on the stage, Kanisha, why don't you go next okay. and talk about um, your focus, which is on, on, uh, on the political impact uh, of the migration. Hello, everybody. Special shout out to the students. Hey, I see you. <laughs> I see you back there. Um, my book is about the political impact of the Great Migration. Hey, students. <laughs> um, and I... Uh, came to it because I got to grad school and I knew I wanted to write about black people and I've been interested in politics since I was very young. Uh, and I knew that lots of black people were Democrats, but I was not sure what that was about. And so I set off on this journey to try to figure out why all these black people were Democrats. I'm a Democrat, was a Democrat in the story, but I still wanted to know what was happening. And so I go back and I go back and I go back and I reach the point where black people are Republicans when the Republican Party is a liberal party, not the Republican Party of today. Uh, and so I'm trying to figure out like what's going on in this switch and in the political science literature there is no answer. They don't say well this is kind of how black folks got into the party in ways that made sense to me. And one of the big things that was missing is this large movement of black people out of the south. And so the story as they had written it was like all these black people lived in the north, they were republicans one day and then the next day they were democrats. That story is not really right. There are a bunch of black people who live in the North, a small bunch of black people who live in the North, and then there are millions of black people who go uh, from the South to the North. And then, so who are those millions of people who could not vote in the South before 1965? And then how do they show up? And so my book is primarily trying to kind of reshape the way we think about how black folks get into the Democratic Party and we use the lens of the Great Migration to say all these people who could not participate in the past go to the North, and in the North they can participate. And so how do they show up in politics? I think they show up as Democrats uh, because the Democratic Party kind of works hard in the cities I write about to get them out to vote uh, and to have them participate. And so the book has three chapters and the chapters exist in kind of two parts. Uh, the first part is about how white politicians respond to the migrants. And so white politicians have varying responses to the migrants. In a place like New York, uh, Mayor LaGuardia is interested in having black folks in his coalition because he is interested in defeating the Democratic Party. Uh, and so he works kind of harder than some of the other mayors to get black folks on board uh, with his work. And a place like Detroit is not so. Detroit doesn't have parties in the way that uh, Chicago or New York has parties. And so the people who are running for office in Detroit run campaigns that are very racist, that say these, Democrat, these black people are coming from the South, uh, they are going to integrate your neighborhoods, and if you want a pure and not white neighborhood, you need to vote against these white liberal people. And so uh, kind of how white politicians interact varies from city to city. Uh, but not only that, I wanted to write a book that was about black people. Many of the books that exist in political science uh, that are talking about civil rights and talking about black people don't have black people in them. And so I wanted it to be the case that we had a book about black people with black people in it. Mm -hmm. um, and so the second half of each chapter is about the black people who migrated, who moved to these cities and got elect elected to office. One of my favorite stories is about a man who lived in New York. His name is Edward Austin Johnson. So Edward Austin Johnson is from Raleigh, North Carolina. In Raleigh, North Carolina, he is elected to the city council in the year 1898. 
and he is a Republican in that story, he's in coalition with white Republicans. And the white Republicans decide later that year that they don't wanna work together with black people anymore. Instead, they wanna be in coalition with Southern white Democrats who were kinda racist at the time, very racist at the time. Uh, and so as a part of that, he loses his seat on the city council. He's not able to participate in politics in the same way. He's furious about it. So in 1907, he decides that he wants to move to New York City, and so he does. He moves here, he establishes a law practice, and he gets involved in politics kind of immediately. Ten years later, he gets elected as the first person to be seated in the New York state legislature. So if you can imagine in your own life moving to a place, and 10 years later, not only being registered, not only being active, but getting elected to office, that's what these people did. And so the second half of each chapter is dedicated to them where we get to talk about their stories, who they are, and what they uh, thought was important. Uh, so Marcia? So <clears throat> my book is called Southside Girls Growing Up in the Great Migration. And previous to that, I had very bad titles for the book. And then in 2008, Michelle Obama introduced herself at the Democratic National Convention in Denver with a short film entitled Southside Girl, um, which not only opened up an opportunity for more people to buy my book, but it <laughs> allowed for um, a reframing of what the South Side of Chicago had been previously a shorthand for. So if we think of South Side as a way of people talking about a series of urban failures, the Obamas opened up the opportunity to think of a, the South Side of Chicago as a generative and creative space where dynamic leadership could be cultivated. And so if the title of my book is dedicated to Michelle Obama, the shadow title of my book, um, which I would say is The Audacity of Hopelessness, is a shout out to the president because one of the things that I thought was really important in writing a book about the experiences of girls and young women during a period of time that is often framed as a triumph, right? African Americans leave the South and they find new opportunity in the North, and that's absolutely true. But if we see this history through the lens of girls and young women, um, people who are most vulnerable to harm and who do not always have the agency to make the decisions when they arrive in Chicago, what kind of story do we get? And so I try to be very attentive in the book to the poignancy of the experience of opportunity. I think that my orientation toward looking at the mixed emotions that change in genders comes from the fact that I'm from an immigrant family, that on one hand, we move to another country because there's so many opportunity, and then there's a deep sadness because so much of our experience is about separation, separation from family members, from loved ones, from community, and a sense of space. And I wanted to really honor and appreciate that, that girls had mixed emotions about an experience that for their parents, they not only imagined as providing economic benefit or relief from the terrorism of the Ku Klux Klan or the opportunity to engage in a leisure, a leisure culture that was designed for African Americans, all of those things are true and it was deeply difficult. And so the book looks at different responses to the presence of African American girls in Chicago. The first is the work of African American women like Ida B. Wells Barnett who is battling the white dominated philanthropy structure to make a case that the care of orphaned African American girls should stay within the community and not be outsourced to a new model of child keeping that makes girls vulnerable. And so there's these really contentious moments with um, Julius Rosenwald, um, the creator of Sears and Roebuck. And if you're of a certain age, you have no idea what I'm talking about. It was a department store. Um, it was before Amazon. You got all your stuff at Sears. Um, and you know, he's an incredible, um, uh, he's incredibly generous in the South, but he also has a presence in the North. And in many ways, it's this idea of who really knows what our girls need. Um, and the remaining chapters look at African-American girls and churches, and the fact that for many African-Americans, they are not welcomed by black churches. They are very uncomfortable with the presence of all of these people who have not socialized themselves in the same ways that they have. And they have this tense relationship. And at some points, church leaders are actually telling African-Americans to stay in the South 
and figure it out. Maybe it'll get better. Knowing full well the ways that communities were vulnerable. And so I talk about the Moorish Science Temple, which was the precursor to the Nation of Islam, and the ways that girls figured as objects of modesty and purity within that framework. I talk about girls at school and the challenges that a lot of African American girls in the South had going to school. So, so much of the great migration rhetoric is the fact that in some cities, um, Chicago wasn't one of them, did not have room for African American children. And so the children who actually go to school, the teachers are a little hostile towards them. They really question whether these girls can succeed. And then on the other end of the spectrum are these really talented African American girls who finish high school and maybe even complete college and they realize that the only economic opportunity for them is domestic work. And so they say like, why did we uproot ourselves for this? And the last thing I'll say about the book, um, that I'm particularly proud of is that um, as a, I'll still call myself a young historian, but as a younger historian, um, when I said that I was writing a book about African American girls, people would say, well, there's no archive. Where are you going to get their stories? How are we going to get their voices? One of the things I learned from doing this project is that we cannot assume that we are the first one to come up with an idea. So I'm not the first one who ever did research on African American girls, but I am of a generation that actually has a platform to publish about it. And so when I went to the University of Chicago archives, they were beautifully written dissertations about African American girls, but because they were written by women, because they were written by African American women, prior to the 1960s, no one published them. And the other kind of major discovery that I made for the book was I was at Howard University's archives. It was a very hot day in August, and it was Washington, D.C., so you can only imagine, you know, how, you know, beleaguered I was by the time I got to the library, and I said, you know, let me go through the papers of E. Franklin Frazier, who I think is probably one of, you know, is one of the most important sociologists um, uh, in the United States. And everything that E. Franklin Fraser thought, he wrote it down and found a way to publish it. But one of the things that I found in his papers is that he had an entire notebook of interviews with African American girls who had participated in the migration, who were in a special program for girls who had unplanned pregnancies. And what that discovery revealed to me was these voices were always there. The question is what were the social shifts that needed to happen for me to emerge and be able to be a professor and a historian to take those voices seriously. And I think that the Great Migration is a topic that we can always think that we've heard all of the stories, but so much of the storytelling is mediated by the politics of who has the opportunity to write those stories and who we think we should listen to in understanding this period of time. Ted, tell us what you've been up to. Yeah, so I want to uh, approach the, the topic from the perspective of the work we do at the Brennan Center, uh, some of which has been touched on here tonight. Uh, certainly the Brennan Center cares about voting rights, um, and about liberty and national security, but one of our other thrusts is around ending mass incarceration. Um, so we know the story. It's well known that the United States locks up a lot of folks. 2.3 million people locked up. Um, the highest rate in the world, in real numbers, more people than any other country in the world, including China and India that have a billion more people each than us. It's also well known that the majority, the, the disproportionate amount of our prison population are black folks. Black people make up 13% of the nation's population, but comprise over 33% of the prison population. Because these two facts are well known, we tend to conflate them and uh, assume that they're related. That is, when the war on drugs was enacted and the prison population spun out of control, there was also aggressive policing of black communities that, in, in racially disparate ways that also led to racial disparities showing up in the prison system. However, the racial disparity in our prison population predates the war on drugs. It goes all the way back to Reconstruction. In 1880, black people were 2.4 times more likely to be locked up than white people. In 1940, black folks were five times more likely to be locked up than white people. And today, that's about six times. So, between Reconstruction and the Great Migration, the racial disparity in our prison population more than doubled, 110% increase. Since the Great Migration, since 1940, including the war on drugs into today, that racial disparity has increased by 20%. So, 
The Great Migration did more for racial disparity in our prison system than the war on drugs. So the problem we see in our country today is not a new one. Uh, this, is, this is baked in, and the migration of black folks to northern cities exacerbated racial disparities that were already existing in our society to a level that we haven't seen um, since. So the question, though, is why? Why is it that black folks that are looking for economic opportunity suddenly are, find themselves imprisoned? Uh, why is it that black folks running away from racial terrorism find themselves incarcerated? I mean, what is it about moving to pursue the American dream that makes folks un intolerable? Uh, the, the question, of course, is rooted in racism, but the, um, it's, it's animated, it's exacerbated by something else, and that is immigration, but European immigration. Between 1890 and 1910, you get about 12 million European immigrants, white European immigrants, coming to the United States. Shortly thereafter, you have black folks moving from the south to the north. Now, when white immigrants came to the United States, they weren't seen as white folks like American white people. They were seen as second-class citizens. And so while they're trying to fight, figure out their way in America, you get a lot of black people that arrive too. And now they're arriving in these very congested urban northern cities where the social order has not been worked out, where the racial hierarchy isn't as binary as black and white. It's sort of white American, those white immigrants, and then those black people from down south. And so, because white European immigrants were arrived before black folks migrated to the north, they were able to establish themselves politically and socially um, through patronage jobs, law enforcement jobs, that sort of thing, that once black people began to arrive, they were able to leverage those positions to establish their own economic security, their own secu the security for their own communities, and the black migrants bore the brunt of their um, search for freedom and opportunity. And so you now have white immigrants who are seeking the, um, the security of becoming white, like white Americans, and black migrants bearing the brunt of that. Now, this isn't just punditry. This is what the data actually show. Um, Irish immigrants, for example, were arrested disproportionately in northern cities. But once black folks began to show up, Irish immigration, uh, uh, the arrest rates for those who immigrated from Ireland decreased while black folks increased. We saw in Pittsburgh, for example, 78% increase uh, in black arrests, and they were never for serious things, things like being suspicious, things like uh, public, uh, being disorderly in public. Um, and so these were petty crimes that wouldn't send them to jail for a long time, but long enough to miss work tomorrow which would lead to firing in an overcrowded market. Now, white immigrants were trying to establish themselves in these cities, which put them in competition, economic competition, residential competition, social status competition with black migrants. And so every time a black person was criminalized, they became less competition for an already limited um, job market. So 78% uh, in, in Pittsburgh, uh, I think, um, the, and uh, um, for New York, Detroit, and um, a few places in Ohio, we see the same thing, and it uh, becomes a problem in the North and uh, leads us to where we are today. So what we all have after a 100-year sweep of history here, um, you have black people in the South who were enslaved and then freed after the 13th Amendment. And then they were, re or they were criminalized in order to help replace the labor force that slavery had abolished. abolished. So the 13th Amendment, I'm sure as you all know, has that little clause in there that says, slavery is over except if you've been committed for a crime, then it's, it's, uh, it's, it's justified. Uh, and so black folks were criminalized there to replace the labor force. So they get out of there and they come north. And then they're criminalized so that they can't get into the labor force and present competition to the white migrants, the white immigrants who are now in these cities. So criminalization of black folks happens to keep us in the labor force in the South and out of the labor force in the North. Taken together, you get mass incarceration, which is terribly racially disparate, and that's what we're uh, seeing the effects of today. So, um I want to follow up with a question for all of you, uh, which perhaps kind of pulls us forward to talk about what's going on now, which is that um, the very moving film 
um, that we that we watched, and necessarily short, so it can't really get into all the nuances. But basically, sort of um, uh, paints a picture of uh, a uh, black folks in the South who were suffering under the uh, worst of Jim Crow uh, in the post Reconstruction era, uh, moving north and immediately facing all the same problems uh, up south, <laughs> as they called it. What I found in the Pittsburgh, uh, in studying Pittsburgh, is that it was a little more complicated than that. And I think that, um, that in fact, what happened, as with Reconstruction, where there was a brief period following the Civil War of, of, of great advancement, politically and, and, and socially and culturally, and optimism within the black community that led to a severe backlash. It actually, in fact, as we all know, you know, a lot of the worst of Jim Crow was, sort of came into being in the wake of Reconstruction. Um, and that's what black folks were escaping. In Pittsburgh, at least, at least for a while, even though things were never great, they were better than they were down south. Um, even through the Depression, until you get to World War II, when there was a period of real hope that black folks would be able, as did a lot of these poor migrant groups, by supporting the war, going off and fighting for America, proving their patriotism, they would come back and they would finally get, you know, a greater measure of equality. In fact, the opposite happened. Right, so, so once you have another period, a uh, brief period of, of black progress and optimism, it's totally shut down after the war. Um, and that's when you start to see a, even worse housing discrimination. Um, you see white flight from, 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 from uh, urban neighborhoods, the schools get worse. Uh, um, uh, we have you know, the problems with the criminal justice system. So here we are today. <laughs> in the wake of you know, eight years of our first black president, when a lot of people would be saying the same thing is happening. You know, we finally got to a point in racial progress uh, where we could elect Barack Obama, and then we get what we, what we have now uh, with, the, with, with this president. So is this a pattern in American history? And if so, I mean, is, did you find that in, in, in the areas and the cities that you covered, and if so, what do we do about it? Because it suggests that it's not hopeless. We do have these periods when things move forward, but then we have these savage backlash periods afterward. Uh, I think the short answer is yes. This, we, I had conversations with, I got in trouble in 2016 because I was trying to tell my friends that I thought Donald Trump was going to win. And they looked at me like I had a third eye. And I was like, listen, well maybe not a third eye, but a second head. And I said, you know, if, we, if history is any indication, when there is great progress in the United States of America, there is great sadness afterwards. They call the period after the reconstruction the, the nadir, black people did. Um, and so I, I don't think that kind of having Donald Trump as a president is a surprise. I think that in my book, at least, I saw the same kinds of things happening. So in Chicago, for example, uh, there is a mayor, uh, Kelly, who is kind of doing okay. And then we have liberal mayors who come after him. And as soon as a liberal mayor gets elected, is in office, does their thing, supports black causes, they are immediately followed by conservative mayors who run on these platforms of, we just had this liberal person who supported black people. I know that you all out there don't like this kind of progress that's happening for black people. If you are upset by that progress, vote for me. And members of the white community come out and vote for the more conservative candidate. And so that happens in a number of cases in my city, in the cities that I studied. I think, yes, that we understand that progress backlash is the kind of force of history. But I think that upon reflection um, over the changes in the political climate in the past few years, I think that we are witnessing something that we have yet to really reckon with, and it's the fact that in the United States, we never stick to any of our good ideas. Our very good ideas, there is always a mechanism to abandon them and then minimize them. 
we never really did reconstruction. It was a great idea that the second it showed its return, there was a mechanism to take it away. And we never did the war on poverty. You know, when I, when I show these things to my students, sometimes they say, well, why were these people so naive? And I said, they weren't naive, because in their own lifetime, they had gone from a Jim Crow regime to seeing the registration of voters in the South. So of course they think to themselves, by 1980, we won't have these problems anymore, because they saw this rapid change. But again, we never gave school integration a real chance. We never did open housing a good chance. You know, right now, the students at Georgetown University are working on a referendum in which they would collect student fees as a reparations gesture towards the fact that the university sold 272 people in 1838. And you know, these young people are being ridiculed. And I'm thinking to myself, they have a good idea. Let us see an opportunity. And so all of this is to say that when I look at the ways that people from the deep south saw something in front of them in the migration process, they saw the good idea of freedom and mobility. And the second that could be realized, even in the smallest way, like a guaranteed wage, or maybe a labor union that would accept them as equal members, or maybe an opportunity that their child could go to a school that had real books in it, that was taken away. And so I think um, it's a cautionary tale to all of us to perhaps invest more in our radical imaginations than our deep desire to suggest that we invalidate any idea that seems new to us. Because perhaps this is what has been missing this whole time. Yeah, and, and so it, it, it's almost like we believe, or the nation believes, that there's not enough America to go around for everyone. Mm -hmm. you know, and what, it's re, what, there, what that really suggests is that there's not enough power for everyone. And United States history would agree with that assertion. Um, the, the Compromise of 1877 uh, is when Rutherford B. Hayes is out of Ohio, Republican. Samuel Tilden is the Democrat from New York. Tilden wins the popular vote. He wins the, he's winning the Electoral College. And there are 20 disputed electoral votes. And what the, Demo what the Republican Party says is we will effectively end Reconstruction. We will pull federal troops out of the South if you allow to shift those 20 electoral votes in dispute to us and allow our Republican candidate, Hayes, to win the election of 1876. And this is agreed to. And Hayes becomes the president on March 4th, 1877. And within a month, he pulls federal protections out of the South that ensured black folks' right to vote, that ensures black folks' right to own property in exchange for the White House. So the voting rights that we, the, the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments that the nation effectively went to war over, a million casualties, was undone in exchange for the White House. Now in sociology, um, they would sort of categorize this generally as, as is, uh, the group threat theory. The idea that when an out group moves in, the in group feels a threat to their interests and develop negative attitudes about the out group. And they use the threat to their interests and those negative attitudes as a way to justify the subjugation of that, those new arrivals. Uh, so after Reconstruction, when you enfranchise black folks, there is a threat to the in-group's interests, and that, that has to be repelled. After the Civil Rights uh, great society legislation of the 60s, there's a threat to, to uh, white social status, agency, whatever, that needs to be uh, put on the back burner, and, and we, the war on drugs becomes a vehicle to, uh, to criminalize a lot of black communities. Back to, to Mark's point, or you know, his observation at, is, uh, uh, folks have talked about quite a bit now, that after eight years of a black president, um, we get this backlash in the election of Donald Trump, and the idea is that uh, there was a sense of loss. So, I mean, it, the word was economic anxiety, but what it really was was a, a sense of loss of social status, um, that something had happened to, uh, to white people in this country that they were being put in the back of the line behind immigrants, behind ungrateful black folks who kneel during the, when the national anthem is played, and they needed to recapture their status recapture their place in the hierarchy. So the backlash is often about some sense of loss, real or imagined, and um, I, I don't know what the, the solution is to um, allow people to feel like America can be expansive and that it's not a zero-sum sum game, that you can actually grow the democracy without disenfranchising people in the process. 
Um, questions from the audience? Anybody? Sir? Yeah. Uh, uh, the uh, mic's just, coming to you. I'm hoping to get in as many questions as possible so we can keep our questions brief. If anybody has okay, here, here an observation, they can come up and talk to us afterwards. Yeah, I saw. I'm a Chicagoan, okay? Parents migrated from the South, Wonderful. Indiana to Chicago, okay? Had family in both places. Um, he just said something that was very important that we must understand. As educators, which all of you are, you know, you made a point that you said you don't know. Okay, one thing that we do know is that there has been a plan against African American people since our existence. There was a plan to keep us in slavery. There was a plan to destroy Reconstruction. There was a plan to start Jim Crow. All of these things were set by people and plans. Even today, we're still living up under someone else's plan. But never has our educators come through with a justifiable plan to say, political party, Democratic Party, if you want our vote, this is our plan. This is exactly what we want. We so don't do you have do a that. question? Sorry, do you okay. have a question? The question of it is, is that could you address anything that would do to bring us into a political structure to where we can set our own plans and not depend upon other people's plans as educators? So this actually, we were talking a little bit about this, um, and I don't want to, I, I think it's basically the same question, which is, you know, it is true that because of the great migration, because of, you know, uh, the, the, the fight for the right to vote and so forth, blacks, black folks have uh, acquired a lot of political power, and um, right now, I think it's pretty clear that they, for a while now, have been the most reliable part of the democratic base. But the question is, what are they getting in return? Um, and if they're not getting enough, is that because of some structural problem with our politics, or is it also a function of black leadership in terms of uh, settling for what in many cases are sort of symbolic gestures as opposed to real policy changes. I'm gonna um, take up something that you said that I think is really important, that if we have a vision of an expansive America, then we have to have a vision of an expansive political process. We know that so many people are disenfranchised because of their citizen status, status their citizenship status, their age, um, felony conviction records. Like There are a number of people who are just out of that process. And at the same time, these are also people who are on the ground leading incredible political movements. Like the city of Chicago, if you see the kind of organizing that Black Youth Project 100, all of those young people are not voter eligible. But boy, did they send a message to Alvarez about being the county prosecutor. Boy, did they send a message to Rahm Emanuel about the way he was running the city. And so I think that these concerns about the Democratic Party are very important. And while we raise those concerns, I think we have to remind people of the power that they have in other capacities, because it's usually in those capacities on the local level, if we look at the civil rights movement, those people weren't voters either. But they had an ability to organize and through education, bring people closer to political processes to get those needs met. So I think it's a, it's a both and. I, yeah, I think that's right. I, um, that's something I talk about a lot at school. I think that the, the greatest possibility for us to have impact is at the state and local level. And it is most often the case that even for those of us who do participate, we are generally thinking about the presidential election as the most important thing when the truth is your city council person matters. In DC this week, we had this big discussion about go-go music and whether go-go music, which is like a, a native black music in DC should be able to play in the streets of DC. And that was settled by people who represent local constituency. So I think that's a good place to get started if we're thinking about like what you wanna do in order to get working. I think in terms of the national question though, uh, there's so much that we have to reimagine. So like one of the things that is different uh, about today than about the time that I write about and that we write about is that like, kind of the issues, some of them are the same, but some of them are different. Black people have kind of very wide ranging notions of what the world should be as they did at that time. But there was in most of the things that I found a common goal we want to end discrimination in X, Y, Z. And so I think that's the case still today. But the way that manifests looks different for different people. Um, I think that we also live in a place where um, this idea of a singular leader 
is kind of dead. And I think as soon as we kind of figure out how we manage that and how we make the idea of dispersed leadership work in a political party uh, on behalf of a people, then we'll be kind of moving in the right direction. But I, I try to be honest with the students, tell them I, I don't know. Um, but I don't know means like, let's think about it together. Let's work on it. Let's test some stuff. Not, I don't know, so let's stop. So I don't know, but let's work to figure it out. Yeah, so one of the things we work on at the Brennan Center is trying to get more states to adopt automatic voter registration to do exactly what you're talking about, which is expand the electorate and get more people involved in the political process. And we've had some really good success over the last couple of years. Um, but to, to your question about black interests, um, unfortunately, if history is a guide, um, the black interest is never the national interest. And when it is, um, when, when we realize racial progress, it's because it is in the nation's interest to expand uh, rights to black folks. So the Civil War didn't come about because Abraham Lincoln had a moral epiphany about the condition of black people. He knew that if the Union was allowed to break up, that internecine warfare was going to break out in the, the continental United States in the same way it did Europe. So saving the Union, and this is from Lincoln's words, his own mouth, saving the Union was the, the priority for the Civil War. If black folks got freed in the process, good, and I'm happy for it, but, but let's just be you know, like real pragmatic about why it happened. In the civil rights movement, from really from 48 to 68, in that time period, that progress from the, the desegregation of the armed forces through to the Fair Housing Act of 68, you had presidents who um, realized that uh, being the champions of democracy and liberty and freedom on the world stage while black folks were being lynched and disenfranchised wasn't a good look. And the Russians knew it too, the Soviets knew it too, because every time we would get on our high horse about democracy, they would say, and you lynch Negroes. That's a hard thing to come back from. And so a lot of civil rights progress um, was benefited from the fact that we were in a Cold War with a communist nation that uh, called us hypocrites on the world stage. So the, the, the book I'm currently writing is about how do we find a way to create multiracial solidarity with, and, and, and create racial progress without having to latch a black interest to something that's unrelated to black people. Uh, and and the, the, the idea, at least uh, in, in my own thinking, is to show that racism is not just about how to subjugate black people. Racism is a crime of the state against all of us. White Americans get less from their nation when they allow their nation to practice racist things. Um, black folks get less than less, um, but none of us benefit from a racist society. We all come up short. And from Bacon's Rebellion in 1676 to the Postal Strike of 1970, every time a multiracial coalition is formed, the elites, political economic elites, find a way to break that coalition by pulling at the racial cleavages. Um, do you believe that... Do you want, you want to go to microphone? Um, do you guys believe that young people have the capacity as young, like, budding voters to try and move forward after the decline following the Trump election? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Hi. Yes. Um, I think that, like, when you, she has a whole book about that, right? So when you go and read the history, when you start to kind of dig through the archives, you will find that the people who are doing the hard work and the people who are telling the truth and like unashamed to tell the truth are young people, your age. And so yes, I absolutely think that you have political power and that you can change the world when you are in coalition with your friends and have strong ideas. Thanks. I'm curious, what, just to latch on to mm -hmm. that, um, what you guys think about the conversation of lowering the voting age? Sure, I mean, as long as people can vote. I am not, I mean, I'm so, disgusted by the mechanisms of voter suppression and I am not over what happened st to Stacey Abrams in Georgia and I, every time I have a public platform I say this because like you said if you don't know what kind of if you're never running a fair race you don't know how good or bad you are right and so all of these mechanisms of disenfranchisement the thing that concerns me is that I think we could possibly in my lifetime elect another president of color heaven help us 
because we have opportunities to expand the electorate. But expanding the electorate is only useful if people can actually vote. And this is something that lowering the voting age is fine, but I am so concerned about all of the dirty tricks around voting. And furthermore, if the young people in this um, room were super excited about elective office, I think that a progressive campaign to vote in secretaries of state to have a 50 state ground game in changing voter laws would probably be one of the best movements that could be ignited right now. Not very sexy, not very interesting, but if you get a bunch of people who understand the importance of access to the ballot, then the ballot can actually mean something. And I think that these are the types of strategies that we did see after 2014 with the rise of the movement for black lives that people were running for local office and young people were running for local office on these really progressive platforms. And so I think that lowering the voting age, reducing voter suppression is the first step and then having a popular education based national movement to teach people about the different ways that they have power. How exciting is that? Is anyone else excited? So, so I wonder so if you all could, 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 since we're talking about migrations, uh, comment, because this is actually something I hear young people debating, which is there is now um, a reverse migration going on. Um, that actually uh, a lot of the black populations, as, as, as the black populations of the northern cities continue to decline, black populations are increasing again uh, in the south. Now there are cultural reasons for that, uh, but there is also a debate uh, or an argument that if you were young and mobile and um, wanting to have a political influence, that you uh, potentially could have a far greater political influence moving back to the South, or maybe to some other, you know, currently red state, um, and trying to make a difference there, uh, rather than um, staying in a place where, you know, you can be active and militant and so forth, but ultimately it's not going to change anything in terms of, of the electoral map. What do you guys think about that? Yeah, I'll just say very quickly, because I think this is an area where my, the other two panelists here have more, more to offer um, from the scholarship standpoint and based on research. But there was a great um, New York Times op-ed maybe a year or two ago about this very thing, and it was written by a black woman who was saying, I think I'm going to move to Atlanta and leave New York. Her reason was, racism is everywhere, but it's expensive as hell in New York. <laughs> And so if I'm going Retweet. to experience racism, I might as well have a lower mortgage and be able to buy a home and, uh, and my, stretch my dollar. So a lot of that reverse migration is still about black folks seeking some sort of economic security that's very hard to find in bigger cities. And uh, so the motivations aren't really um, that different. Uh, and the last thing I'll say is I know a number of folks who have left the North to move to North Carolina, where I'm originally from, uh, to Atlanta. Um, even to Charleston, and they say, I come to Atlanta, for example, and I see lots of black middle class people and their, their families, and they're driving these fancy cars and have great jobs and live in these big neighborhoods with million dollar homes, all black folks. And the only time I ever hear the N word is on, you know, in hip hop songs or sort of um, in, in social settings, but I've never been called that in these places. It was in when they lived in Chicago in New York where they were actually called the N-word. And so it's not just a matter of like economic security, but there's also a, a social a community of blackness in the South that feels different and, and a relationship across racial lines in the South that comports itself differently than it does in the North. Yeah, I think that that piece about the economic uh, motivations for moving is really important and it's something that you hear people talking about. If you talk to uh, a black recent college grad, they're going to be telling you stories about Atlanta, Charlotte, uh, Houston, and they are talking about that thing all the time. But uh, another thing that they are, th I think they're thinking about um, that kind of shows up in the Great Migration is these access to middle class networks. And so I want to go to Atlanta. Um, but I don't, I don't want to just go to Atlanta. I want to go and like be in Jack and Jill. I want to go and like play with. Uh, Does everybody know what Jack and Jill is? Okay. Oh, so Jack and Jill is this organization of women who uh, get together in the North in many instances so that their black children will have other black children to play with, but not just um, black children, like upper or middle class black children. Yeah, 
this, I was not in Jack and Jill, so I don't. I'm telling you what I heard, right? Um, and so I think what I'm trying to say is that they're looking for a community, but like a specific type of community that you can't get unless you, you necessarily have a large population of black people. Um, I think the return migration is something that's really important. That'll be book number two, hopefully. And I think that that leads to a Stacey Abrams, right? And so we're not having conversations yeah. about a black woman being like competitive in Georgia unless the black people in Georgia's coalition are big enough to be in coalition with other people and then put her in a position to get elected, except they stole it. So in this conversation, I'm gonna be myself and be a little bit of a downer. Um, I, so I think out-migration is fascinating and I remember in Chicago in the 90s, like my friends' families are being like, we're done with the snow, we're done with the cold, we're done with this nonsense, we're going to Atlanta, we're going to Atlanta. But if you remember the mortgage um, crash, and the ways that this out-migration really, really affected the precariously middle-class families that were searching is, for me, reminiscent of the family that moves to Chicago and is living in a kitchenette with three other families for $25 a week when they shouldn't be living in those conditions. And so the reason why I raise this is there is something deeply poignant about all of these attempts at black relief that are met with an economic structure that isn't just about the, um, the funny mortgages that, that bust, but also the states that they're moving into don't have the best labor laws, that even if, Las Vegas is a very good example of this, right? Even if you can become somewhat middle class working at a casino, you don't have the kind of labor protection sometimes, depending on what union you're in, t in case you get sick, right? And so some of these structural things, I think, we also have to imagine because growing a black middle class is not going to save us from this. Yeah. If this is a middle class that is um, middle class on borrowed time. And so some of these movements, again, are the ways that even when African Americans are well educated and well situated, they are painted into this corner that doesn't allow for the generational wealth building and sometimes only allows for temporary access to power. Mm. So. It seems to me that an issue that goes hand in hand with voter suppression is um, the funding of our elections. If it takes the backing of a billionaire to get elected, then we have elected officials who are accountable to billionaires first. How do you, do any of you have thoughts or ideas on how to change a process so the voices of the electorate actually help shape a political agenda? So this is where I get to plug the Brennan Center very quickly. Um, I would invite you to go to our website where we have a lot of materials on campaign finance reform that we're not only working federally, nationally, but also in New York State um, with a, a pretty significant success, hopefully, on the way um, here in the state. So, so yes, we are thinking about that. Um, and it's necessary because there was a, a pretty uh, widely read paper that came out in 2014 by uh, Guylands and Page, I think, um, and these two scholars, what they found was uh, they wanted to know is government responsive to, like who, who was government responsive to? And what they found was it's not the people and it's not movement. Government is, responsible, is responsive to organized business interests and economic elites. Period. Now, in those instances where you could get elites to line up with the, uh, what the public wants or what a movement wants, then you would see movement on those, on those uh, issues. But um, if the government only responds to those with resources, then it looks pretty dire for, for the public. Uh, and so this is why campaign finance reform is, is important, because if politicians are self-interested folks, and they are, as, as most of us are in, in various ways, then they care most about re-election. And if their re-election is not contingent on big dollar fundraising, but there is contingent on winning the support of the majority of the populace, um, to include financial support, then perhaps we get a government that's more responsive to uh, the public than to the moneyed. Um, but I don't know, and you know, maybe we've had periods of American history where the people where um, the people have put their candidate in, and I think in some respects, some folks think we're we're in a period like that now. Um, and I don't know that this is actually a better instance. Um, so it's not just about being responsive to the people but also uh, being a liberal democracy where the majority doesn't overrun the minority uh, just because they have subordinate numbers. 
I think I'm gonna uh, continue to be an optimist here and encourage you to think about or look at local elections. And so I kind of come into politics at FAMU, shout out to the Rattlers, um, uh, and, and this wonderful, like very dynamic friend of mine is running for city commission. His name is Andrew Gillum. He just ran for governor of Florida. And so Andrew Gillum is a student at FAMU. He is running for the city commission against a young white man who is so old in Tallahassee family history that like one of the main streets where Florida State University is located is named after this kid. And so he is the heir apparent, he's gonna win. Uh, what they don't recognize is that the kids at FAMU have a plan. We have registered to vote, they weren't paying attention. We stayed home for the first summer election, they weren't paying attention. We showed up and we voted Andrew Gillum into office. And so, yes, Government in many ways is beholden to business interests, elite interests, absolutely, especially at the national level. But sometimes there is magic at the local level where you can get your people together, figure out what your win number is, and move folks to the polls to upset some stuff that people might not think you can upset. One more question. All right, so Mark, you mentioned um, the impact of um, the brain drain in Pittsburgh. So I had a question for all the panelists. Um, what was the immediate impact of great migration on the black people who stayed in the South in terms of politics and, um, and socially? Wow, that's a great question. Yeah. There's, there's increasingly better scholarship on the people who stayed. Um, this is, I mean, it's a lot kind of like immigration to the United States. So remittances, so money sent back home is allowed to keep people alive, right? During um, periods where there's instability in the agriculture market, you know, people are able to send some money back south. I think one of the big impacts is that there is a um, exchange of Southern culture which becomes urban and becomes popular culture in this really interesting way. And so there are things that are deeply Southern that become black and then black becomes urban. So there's some cultural exchange stuff that's really interesting. But I think for the people who were left, um, the people who chose not to leave or the people who were left behind, there was this deep, um, there was this, I think that there was a real challenge by the time the 60s come about how black people were going to be in solidarity with each other in terms of civil rights organizing. And this is the classic story of Martin Luther King going to Chicago and people are like, keep that mess in the South. And so each party is trying to say, how do we keep things at a place where we can stay safe uh, stay safe and not rock the boat too much as we're trying to organize and agitate. And so I think that there's still a lot to be learned from how families survive because there are some people who go back and forth, north and south, but there's some people who said, I'm never going back to the south. And they meant it and they kept to that. And so I think on one hand you have disruption in family systems, but you also have a kind of um, connected politics that is played out, and I think Martin Luther King and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference becomes a proxy for some of those tensions when people in the North are saying like, please, don't bring, don't bring this trouble here. And I think that repair, I think we're still in that process of repair between Northern and Southern black communities. You know, I mean, even though uh, on a state level, um, uh, most of those states remain quite conservative, um, at the city level, I think that there, you could make an argument that there, the, 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 um, uh, the, the sort of uh, black establishment, business and political establishment, and the white political establishment have found ways of working together that's more productive than what you see in the North now. I mean, I think that's true in Atlanta. I think that's true you know, now in New Orleans. It's true um, uh, in a number of other cities uh, as well. So there was still, um, you know, as, as, as awful as, as the worst of, of the history of the South was, white folks and black folks had to deal with each other. You know, they always had to deal with each other. Even when it was violent, they had to deal with each other. Part of the problem of the, of the North was that folks weren't even dealing with each other. I mean, black folks, you know, increasingly, you know, ended up, you know, in neighborhoods that were, you know, uh, you know, predominantly and then finally, ultimately, in a lot of cases, you know, completely black. The white folks split for the suburbs and nobody really learned how to get along. Um, so, um, you know, it's, it's sort of an irony that, that in the end of the day, I'm not saying that, that it, w it was in any way easy for the, for the folks who stayed in the South, 
but I think that um, there is a kind of progress that eventually happened in parts of the South that I still don't think we've, we've gotten to in the North. Yeah, I, would, I think that I would add to that, um, that there are some people in the writings who say, there's a debate. And so there are some people in the writings who are saying, I will not go north because I believe that my fight is here in the south. And so some of the brains stay in the south. There is also a part of the migration that my family is a part of that we don't talk about much, is, which is people going from like Georgia to Florida. And so sometimes people go from south to further south. Uh, and some of the brains go in that direction too. And so the people who are in the south intentionally are organizing folks in the south to help the South, in addition to some of the migrants who go to New York, Chicago, Detroit, et cetera, get elected to office. And when they are elected to office and sitting in state legislature say, I want this for my people here, and you need to be careful about what you do to the South. They say that in their state legislatures to the white people in the state legislatures. And they say the same things when they go to Congress, for example, Adam uh, Clayton Powell is representing New York, but is the, the black congressman for the nation. And he makes it clear that I represent New York, but I represent all black people too. I think we may have time for one more question. Yeah. Hello. Um, we have seen patterns in urban areas of voter, um, voter suppression over-policing, not having access to comprehensive health care, no matter if it's mental health or obstetrics and gynecology, um, and food insecurity. Um, last week, we did have a particular artist and um, community leader murdered in Los Angeles. And um, in these urban areas, we often feel like there's no hope when we go back and we um, help in communities like um, that are underprivileged. So my question is, what advice would you give to young adults in urban communities who want to better their communities but don't know where to start or are scared of bettering underprivileged um, neighborhoods in fear of community pushback? And what, just, just to both keep it brief but also sort of, sort of specific, what is something you can do that you can do? I mean, that's not waiting for society to change overnight. That is an enormous question. Um, I, one of the thing, I think it depends on where you come from and where you come to it from. So I am from a place called Lauder Hill, Florida. Uh, I haven't been living in Lauder Hill, Florida since I was 18. And so if I wanted to go and do work in Lauder Hill, Florida, even though I'm from there, I feel like I have to have conversations with people in Lauder Hill about what they want. Um, and so I think that's kind of where you start. I think you uh, work with the people who live in these places to determine what they want and need. And then you just gotta figure out like how the systems are organized to create these bad situations and then figure out like how it might be possible to shake that up. Um, I don't have a specific like answer for you, but that would be my guess. I think you need to be in community with folks who live in the community. I think you need to think about what you want to accomplish, put those things in order, kind of think about what is possible or not, uh, and then figure out what the systems are and how you attack them. Yeah, and, and I would add, um, you have to have a concrete asks of the community. So you can't say, um, we want more economic justice in the hood. Because uh, if, if the mayor were to say, okay, let's do that, now you don't have a plan of action. So it has to be very concrete. Um, it could be $15 minimum wage, it could, but it, it has to be something that uh, a person can actually deliver on instead of a broad overarching objective. Uh, and so the more you're able to narrow down, this is what my community needs, and, and be very specific about those needs, uh, the more likely you are to find an audience or at least be able to, to negotiate around that specific ask instead of the broader principle. Um, no one, I don't care, I mean, in, on both sides of the aisles, both parties will probably say, yes, we want more economic opportunity in the inner city. But the ideas of how to get that in the inner city are very different on both sides of the aisle. Uh, and so just saying economic opportunity is sufficient. You have to have some very specific asks. The, the other part of this, though, um, is that government is meant to, fr I don't, I don't want to say it's meant to frustrate you. Government bureaucracy is constructed in a way that is extremely frustrating for people who want to get things done. And so um, you, you cannot disengage uh, because th the system is constructed for those with resources, not just money, but time, 
to uh, those are the folks that are able to affect change. Uh, and so when you bump up against roadblock and road, you know, roadblock after roadblock, um, it's easy to say, these folks ain't going to listen to us anyway. Let's go find something else to do or um, don't disengage, uh, but redouble your efforts and be very specific about your, your demands and, um, and, and fight the good fight and beyond that. And remember, everyone has something to offer. Everyone doesn't have to wait till they're educated, perfect, eloquent, can talk to 7,000 people. Someone's good at making sandwiches, someone's good at babysitting, someone can make a sign, someone can make a phone call, someone knows how to use social media. Everyone has something to offer. And at the end of the day, the thing that really sustains good movements is the capacity for people to do something well, feel empowered, and try more things. And within communities that amplify that, people love each other radically. And this is really the key thing that's going to keep any group that's in any type of struggle together, a deep love and commitment to what's being done and an appreciation for what people have to offer. Mm. And, and I would just add, and I hate to be the one to bring up Martin Luther King and a black, you know. No, it's so but, true. But, but it's, uh, the Montgomery bus boycott is a lesson. He was, what, 26 or something at the time? And Rosa Parks did all the groundwork for him. And so. she, a lot of the groundwork Shout done by black women. women behind the scenes, that's for sure. Yeah. But, but they managed to boycott the bus system in Montgomery for a year. Could you imagine if you stopped taking MTA for a day? For a year. And it wasn't like they all had cars. So they arranged carpooling, babysitting services. They figured out a way to, to do without the thing they needed most to get to their jobs. And the only way they did that was with young folks' energy, their ideas, their sense of community and solidarity, and the endurance uh, to stick with it because they felt they were right, and a very narrow and concrete ask. Right. Desegregate the buses, period. Um, uh, I think we're gonna have to wrap up. I, 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 we wanna thank, uh, first of all, Carnegie Hall. Um, uh, Ma'am, you're welcome to come up and ask us questions afterwards um, uh, uh, for, uh, for supporting this panel and making us part of their celebration of, of migrations. It's an honor uh, for the Brennan Center and for, for everybody up here. Uh, I wanna again thank uh, our panelists uh, Kanisha Grant, um, uh, Marsha Chatelaine, and Ted Johnson. Um, Marsha and I have our books done and written and available if anybody wants to buy them, and we'd be happy to sign them uh, after the panel. Um, uh, finally, I want to thank Ted uh, yes. for putting this thank together, you. as well um, as uh, Lisa Vosper and Adam uh, Abel, who worked on the film, and also for uh, uh, the footage um, uh, provided by the Library of Congress, the Louis B. Nunn Center for Oral History at the University of Kentucky, the New York Historical Society, and Up South African uh, American Migration, the era of the Great War. Um, uh, for anybody who wants to continue to follow the work of the Brennan Center, um, the uh, website is brennancenter.org. Uh, also has a Facebook page, a Twitter account, videos on YouTube, and now podcasts on iTunes. Uh, welcome to the world of podcasts. Uh, it's, uh, it's really been an honor uh, to join you tonight. Um, and uh, like I say, we'll, we'll be hanging out for a few minutes if anybody has further questions. Thanks very much.